The prayer and pledge led by Councilmember Keaton Fish. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight thankful for Goddard, Kansas, thankful for the opportunity to continue to grow. Lord, I pray that you would just bless this space with your presence, God, and allow us to make in, in decisions tonight uh, that are informed and absolutely best for the future of this community. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. We got no executive session. Do we have any questions with the agenda? Can I make a motion to approve the agenda? Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Aubrey. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. <coughs> Citizen comments. Who'd like to come up and speak? Angie, the star. <laughs> Good evening, Council and Mayor. Um, I'm Angie Dentz with the Goddard Chamber, and I just want to give you a brief update on the Fall Festival as we are getting very, very close. And so, first of all, we do have our buttons in. Um, you can buy these in person at Goddard Central Wine and Liquor Spirits. Get it wrong every time, sorry. <laughs> and also at Ace Hardware, um, but you can also still get these online. If you order them online, then your name is put into um, a chance to win a meet and greet. So that's the perk of ordering them online. And then we will be announcing will call times to pick buttons up if you did order them online. Um, you only have two weeks left to get those for $30 and they go up to $50 on October 1st. So encourage people to get those as soon as possible. Just wanna clarify a couple of things um, that we're hearing, but you must have a button to get into the concert after 3 p.m. So the concert area and the beer garden will be fenced. It will be screened and you will not be able to see the concert if you don't buy a button. Um, you will not be very close and no outside coolers or beverages will be allowed at any time during the fall festival. Um, so don't plan on bringing the cooler and hanging out outside the fence. Um, it won't be allowed <laughs> for safety purposes. Um, and also bring your own chair. And then lastly, we are in the process of submitting our fall festival guide this week. So last chance for sponsorships if anybody's interested. Um, tickets are selling and we're very, very excited. So just a few more weeks. And thank you again um, to the city of Goddard for supporting all of our awesome community events. I got a question. Yep. So how many tickets do you think we've sold so far? Um, we are just over about a little over a thousand. Okay, good. I so sold four in the store. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned oh, something about that. banners earlier. How, how, what are the dimensions of the banners? Um, I would have to. Well, that's cool. I mean, just in. It's an eight foot by three foot. Okay. And they're two hundred dollars. Well, perfect. Well, thank you, Angie. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. <coughs> Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Sold. Okay, we're moving on. Item E1 appointment to the library board. Mayor and City Council. This is E1 library appointment. Uh, so Megan Koenigs uh, would love to serve the community of Goddard as a member of the library board. Uh, she believes libraries are vital to communities and would love to serve in that capacity. She believes she could bring a unique perspective as a lower elementary school teacher and she thoroughly enjoys working with a team of people who are dedicated to making a difference in the lives of others. Megan was appointed to the city council, or excuse me, to the library board city council on February 21st of 2023 to fill a vacancy. Uh, if appointed, this would be her first of two four-year terms. So if you're filling a vacancy, then you can still serve two four-year terms. If she was repeating a, um, a four-year term, then she could only do it twice. So at this point, just looking for a motion approval to appoint her to the library board. Make a motion to approve Megan to the library board. Motion by Keaton. Second. Second by Sarah. All in favor say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Okay. Very good. All right. Consent agenda. Do you guys have any questions with the consent agenda? Minutes and count payable. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Aubrey. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, item H1. <coughs> 
Honorable Mayor and City Council, this is H1 Assessment Proceeds for the Southeast Corridor List Station. So, quick background. Uh, during discussions of the Arbor Creek development, it was decided that a portion of the cost associated with the list station to serve the development would be assessed to about 172 lots in this development as authorized by resolution number 20-05. During a recent conversation, it discovered that these costs had not been assessed to those 172 lots, and as such, to fill the intent of the resolution of number 20-05, these lots need to be assessed $110,000. This requires a public notice to be published in the city newspaper and letters sent out to all affected parties. The city will need to have a public hearing on the matter and anyone desiring to speak can do so during this time. The letter sent to property owners will have the date of the public hearing stated so they are aware. Since this is a um, collection for additional revenue and the bonds have already been sold as permanent financing, it is advisable to not issue any additional bonds for 110000 as it would incur additional costs for underwriting and sale and it could be difficult to sell this bond due to being viewed as undesirable for such a low amount. It should be noted that not issuing bonds for this type of improvement is a deviation for standard Kansas law, and as such, a city could be required to issue bonds if legally challenged. If approved, the city council would be established on October 2nd as a date for the public hearing, and letters of notice would be sent out to all affected property owners. So the city council is considering assessing 110,000 to 172 lots in the Arbor Creek development for a portion of the costs incurred for the construction of the Southeast Corridor lift station. Each lot will be assessed about $639.54. They have until November 3rd, 2023, to pay them out in full or in part, after which there will be 20 annual installments equaling about $31.97 per year or around $2.66 per month. Lots to be assessed are listed as follows. And these numbers are just general numbers. They may be higher. And these are the following lots as listed in that original resolution. There's small cost for publication legally. It's approved as a form. It is recommended City Council approve the resolution in the publication setting a public hearing and the issuance of letters and notice for affected property owners for assessing the additional cost of $110,000 for the Southeast Corridor lift station. I mean, most uh, motion in the second. We do have Kevin Cowan, uh, Gilmore Bell, our bond attorney, and Brett Showman of uh, Steve Nichols to be represented here as well. Ryan, do you want to give an <coughs> overview on why we? the history on how we got here or do you <laughs> want me to mine is always going to be more flavorful so i'm asking well, you well I'm, I'm i i love flavor okay so <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh the history behind this is we had this 1.3 million dollar lift station that the city of goddard paid for and the agreement was that this Arbor Creek addition, phase one, was going to pay $110,000 towards that lift station. And that did not happen. What happened was someone in the last administration sent an email waiving that cost and the city had to eat it. Well, that is not appropriate and that's not correct. And so now we are having to go back and fix what was done wrong in the past. And so now these neighbors are gonna have to get a notice saying their special assessments are going up this certain amount, but you know when you make a mistake as an organization, you have to go back and fix it. You can't just the city of Goddard as a whole should not eat one hundred and ten thousand dollars in cost. So, if anybody has any questions, that's the general overview. So that would just clarify it wasn't waived. Okay, there we go. All right. <coughs> any questions? <laughs> No, no, no. That's that's yeah, probably it, it the right word. Yeah. We never voted on it. Yeah, we never was, voted on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it was voted on. Not to wait to assess it. Yeah, to assess it, and mm. it was never assessed. Well, then yeah. not to was made to, not to eat to it. That yeah, right. At the time. That's the right words. Okay. Do we have any questions? Any comments? Do I have a? motion make a motion to approve the resolution and the publication setting a public hearing and the issuance of letters of notice for affected or affected property owners for assessing the additional cost of 110,000 for the southeast corridor lift station motion by sarah i'll second second by aubrey all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. okay very good this is item h.2 this is the reinvestment housing incentive district act resolution so the Reinvestment Housing Incentive District, RHID, is a program designed to assist in the development of housing for areas approved by the Kansas Department of Commerce. The program allows the city to reimburse developers for eligible costs incurred during the development of specific tracts of land identified by the city council's ideal for future housing. 
The increment in ad valorem taxes generated from the value of new housing units would be used to provide reimbursement with the exception of 1.5 mills from the state levy and 28 mills from the school district. The school district and the county have veto authority to deny a development. Uh, an RHID track will allow the city to supplement the capital stack for development to incentivize the creation of desirable housing developments. City Council is reviewing a resolution to establish a geographic boundary with multiple tracks of the possibility of RHID. Step one is the preparation of a housing needs analysis, which was completed by the city based on the June 2023 audit housing study produced by WSU. This is exhibit H.2C. Uh, step two is to adopt a resolution establishing the RHID and the city sends a resolution in the housing needs assessment to Secretary of Commerce. This is exhibit H.2A. Step three, the Secretary of Commerce agrees the housing needs analysis and the city can proceed with the establishment of the district. The housing needs analysis summary is exhibit H.2D. Step four, the city and the developer collaborate to finalize a uh, rural housing incentive district development plan and development agreement outlined how the development will proceed and how it will be financed. And the city publishes a resolution to call a public hearing and the development ag agreement is sent to the Board of County Commissioners and the school district. Step five, 37 days after adoption of the resolution, which is number two, the city presents the development plan and any interested party may be heard. At conclusion of the hearing, the governing body may establish the district by ordinance, which is subject to a 30-day veto period. So there's a lot going on here. Feel free to ask questions on this. We do have, as mentioned, uh, Kevin Cowan, Gilmore, Warren Bell here. Uh, Brett Shogren is our financial uh, advisor. And Ryan Peck, city attorney. Um, reimbursement of costs must be deemed eligible in the following categories, land acquisition, site preparation, sanitary system sewers, drainage conduits, channels and levees, street grading paving, street light fixtures, connections and facilities, gas, water, heating, electrical services in the public right of way, sidewalks, water mains and extensions, permanent improvements for the upper levels of downtown building 25 years old. So this one generally probably be used in this one. So this is a kind of an example of some numbers. So like I said, feel free to ask questions. This is just kind of a rough outline, but hypothetically, if you had a parcel or a track of land that was $20,000 and we're assessing it at 30% because it's vacant, but it's vacant ag, then it'd be 30% assessment, then that would be around $6,000. General property tax levied against it would be around that, um, would be 810.23, which would be 135 mils. And so the breakdown would be as follows with the dollar amount. Goddard would be making a $187.85 every year. And over a 25 year period, we'd make $4,600. And so if we took into account a development that was $15 million, for example, um, a residential development, and it was assessed at 11.5, then the breakdown would be as follows. At 31 mils, we'd get $54,000 a year. And if we took a portion of that dollar amount that we were capturing in difference between what we had at, with the eight that with the um, eight hundred dollars with the assessment at thirty percent, and we split it, let's say hypothetically at fifty percent to reimburse a portion of the cost, the city would still be collecting over six hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars as opposed to the forty-six hundred that we were collecting without the development. So it's sort of a tit for tat. I'm sort of a give and take in that way. This is our proposed 2035 limit, sort of generally speaking, of how we're assuming we're gonna be growing over the next couple of years. This is our current city limit in orange. We've identified certain tracts of land for potential development. These ones, this one in particular, and these couple over here are all what's called by right zoning. So hypothetically, if you wanted to put an apartment complex on any of the red tracts of land, it's called by right, so that means it's already zoned and you can do the apartment immediately. And so that's something to be taken into account. These other ones are under consideration for future development potentially. These ones would have to be negotiated. These ones in green is something that we can consider for future annexation. Right now with a reinvestment um, incentive district, all the tracts of land for consideration have to be within the city limits. So these green ones could be considered as a potential future annexation because you can use the reinvestment incentive district to kind of um, entice property owners into annex it into the city limits which is a unique tool because wichita is exempt from using the rhid well we can use the rhid to entice future property owners to annex for future development financially there is none legally it's approved as the form it is recommended City Council approve the resolution which establishes the reinvestment housing incentive district for the recommended tracts of land and or any additional tracts of land as they see fit. 
Um, I know there might be some questions related to this, so feel free to ask at this time. And the maps are available. The resolutions you probably noticed are empty for the exhibits because we have to actually have your approval to add those legal descriptions and then that final map to send off to the Secretary of Commerce. So Can you what step, and, and you laid out some steps, step one, housing needs assessment, step two, which step are we at? Right now, this is step two. Okay. So basically, we're saying, hey, Secretary of Commerce, can we do this? Yeah, and Kevin, feel free to chime in at any time. No, that's... That sums it okay. up. That is correct. Okay. Making it simple for me. Yeah. Thank we, you. And <laughs> each, each particular development, so can you go back to the yeah. map? Even put the green in there, because I'd like to add some more green into this. But let's say, just because we send this map off to the state, then whatever that development has has an individual per development a development agreement with the city of Goddard. Mm -hmm. So we're saying, hey, this is kind of the areas we want to incentivize to grow in Goddard, and then. If it were to be approved, then it comes back to the city, and they say, hey, we want the homes, we want to put an apartment complex, and then the city in that particular development hashes out the development agreement, okay, we'll give X amount of percent for this, X amount of percent for that, so we still have further control going forward. But what this is pretty much doing is sending it off to Topeka saying, hey, we want to incentivize growth in these areas. All right, so once Topeka approves it, then we're gonna ha you would have to hash out a development agreement for every single, so hypothetically right now, you can't approve any of the greens to be in the RHID. They can only be in if they're in the city limit. So you can only really hash out development agreements with these ones. But let's say, for example, we do have Mr. Rick Warner who wants to put that apartment complex over here. So then we would work with them to establish a development agreement. And then once we've established a development agreement, we set a public hearing and we have basically an opportunity for people to speak. That development agreement is going to list out how this project is being cash flowed. That's typically what you would see in what's called a capital stack, which is when you have a development, you have debt, certain types of debt. You have what's called primary debt. It's when you go to a bank and you ask for a loan. Then you have what's called a mezzanine loan, which is basically a second mortgage. And then you have primary equity, which are investments, which that's where we would be. And then you have uh, principal equity, which comes from the developer. That's how you cash flow a development. And so this basically incentivizes a portion of that capital stack, so there's less debt that has to be acquired from the bank. So then it looks more desirable for that project to move forward and they can get financing. And that's a way that you can ha actually incentivize specific types of development if you want to see them. But historically, we haven't seen those types of developments before, like okay. apartments or condos or townhomes or things of that nature. Can you go back to all of the things that qualify for the RHI? The, yes. So one thing that I think is going to be huge, I don't know if most people understand, th this I believe happened last year. The state of Kansas allowed this RHID program to go from 10,000 in population for cities to help incentivize to 60,000 in population. And what this allows the city of Goddard to do is we keep on having a, a problem with growth, dragging our infrastructure, the water, the sewer mains. So if we create a district and it gets approved by Topeka, then we can not just use our dollars, but we can use the school districts, counties, states. And so we get, I think, everything but not the, the states. No, not the states. Not the states. They hold on to their okay, own. Okay, and the bond the, and the school bonds. Correct. And the school bonds, but then we get the schools. Correct. We get. Yeah. We we don't touch the school bonds. Yeah, the school has got some bonds. So basically, twenty eight, according to um, according to Colsonelli, they have basically what's called twenty eight protected mills. Um, and so you're only really allowed to touch the school districts that are unprotected, which would be about twenty six point nine four nine. So you can touch this twenty six. You can't touch this twenty eight. Twenty of that is the statewide school levy for okay. operation and maintenance, but the bond and interest is not part of that. So there would be a portion of the school okay. district levy that creates part of this increment. So, in the most simplest form, is now the city of Goddard, if approved, we have a lot more dollars that we can use to invest in infrastructure to continue to grow, and that's huge. I mean, most people don't understand, but 
we're getting ready to do, or hopefully we're getting ready to do, um, because this is going to really help the city grow, and other cities across the state, but I think just in my last month working with different engineers and everybody, this is all pretty new to everybody else as well. So we're all kind of learning that. Is there any questions, I guess? Um, I guess along with this, I need to put a disclosure here, right? Do you want to do the disclosure, Mike? That's yes, the right words yes. Uh, there has to be a disclosure here that some of these lots are in the Gutter Galleria, which is under the Dugan development. Um, I reached out to Dwayne Dugan and asked for these ones specifically to be put in because these have what's called buy right zoning, which means that you can put in apartments immediately. So this is not something that Mayor Larkin asked for. This is something I asked for. I reached out to Dwayne Dugan as a developer to see if you'd be inclined to have a rural housing incentive district or sorry reinvestment incentive district that you need in this area because this is also in our star bond district so any apartments that go in here would actually help with the star bond development so we have some geo bonds that are in this area the property taxes from here that we collect would go to paying off the geo bonds but also we would have if we put apartments in there we would be collecting more on water rates. So for example, when we have every, anybody who's connected to our water system is paying for water service, both water and sewer. And so the more developments that we can have in this area will actually help spread the cost of future infrastructure needs that we would have. And so this is something that would also help working in tandem with density for helping support commercial development. So uh, when I say buy right, it means that they could build an apartment over here tomorrow without having to go through rezoning, which is called the entitlement process, and so it actually helps expedite that process faster. So anyways, I just want you all to know that there's a few parcels in here that do got the big D next to their name, I guess. <laughs> so, so you approach Mr. Dugan about it? Yes, yes, so I, we've, we typically reach out to most developers when we're talking with them, so I haven't spoke with Ben Healy yet about this possibility, but he's already platted this for patio homes, for apartments, et cetera. So it's already zoned as a PUD. It's going through the process right now for finalization of the PUD, which is planned unit development. This one over here is in the Goddard Starbond over by the Genesis. And so this one is already zoned general commercial. This is already zoned general commercial. So those ones can have apartments put in immediately, which would actually help the city. Now, can you expand out, Micah, to the green? Let's explain that more, and I'd like to try to add yeah. a little bit more brown in this green area. So the green well. is, just to be clear, the green is theoretical, because you can yes. only approve tracts of land that are in the orange, which are already in the city limits. Green, or outside the city limits. So we are only really would be c considering the green as a theoretical situation. If hypothetically somebody wanted to annex, then we could say we would consider amending the resolution to include you into that RHID district. Right now, they can't be included. It can only be these people can be included because they're already in the city limits. These people would have to be enticed to annex into the city limits, and then you would have to consider amending the resolution to include them in the RHID as a potential incentive tool. If we get that far, does that go back to the state? with the new property area, or I mean, is that something back to the that state. Yeah. Okay. So if we incentivize, so I know that's a lot of different moving parts, but let's say hypothetically, any of the ones that are in green wanted to join, then we would say, hey, city council, do you want to amend the resolution? If you say, sure, we'll amend the resolution if they want to annex, then we annex them, or prior to annexing them, because it would be contingent upon the approval by the state, then we would send that amended resolution to the state to say, are you guys okay with us adding this extra district? Which generally, I don't know if we would get a lot of pushback on that from the state, because the state generally wants to see more development. And so then we would be able to annex them into the property limits and then talk about future development. How, what's your plan to reach out to the property owners in the green parcel, in the green parcel? I would just show up at the front door. Okay. <laughs> I would explain <laughs> everything I explained. No, I. He'd be all over Facebook. Yeah. Does anybody know who this guy is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, basically, we would just start one at a time, reaching out, seeing if they feel inclined. If they're really not inclined at all, there's no point to discuss that. But if some of them do feel inclined, then we could bring it to city council. Hey, this property owner contingent upon you guys approving the resolution, the state okaying it, amending the resolution, they want to be annexed, and here's a petition to be annexed. 
And so then that would be a very easygoing discussion at that point. I want to add a little bit more green to the map. So we did a study back two years ago, I think it was, Harlan, the, the Boffman study. Yes. And in the Boffman study, we already have some of the development where uh, Mr. Kelsey is off of 167th and, and Pawnee that was in one of their corridors. But there's a whole corridor that was in the Boffman study that isn't in the rural water <coughs> district. And it's the southwest corridor. Can you kind of show the region, Mike? This, this area? Just all of that, yeah, area, kind of down to 31st Street, you know, that whole area. And that is pretty much like the ideal spot for the city of Goddard to grow. The reason why is it's not in the rural housing incentive district and it's kind of open. It's pretty pretty open kill. Um, uh, it's not in the rural water district. Is but what it, and it's not in the rural water district. Yeah. But I'm not 100%. I mean, some of it, Harlan, is some of that in the rural water district or not? I, and off the top of my head, I can't tell you, but I have a map in my office that I can look up. Yeah. I didn't so think it was. I thought the stuff that Marv was, wasn't. It wasn't. It is. It is. it is. it is. And then the stuff to the west wasn't. Some of this is not in the rural water district number four, so that right. we yeah. don't have to negotiate with the rural water district yeah. to work out a development agreement. Every time we go to do a development with the rural water district, we have to end up paying or the developer has to end up paying. And so anytime you do a development that's not in the rural water district number four, um, it saves us some cost. Now, along with all of this, we have the new Rick Warner project um, right there off of 199th. So where 6S Sports Bar and Grill is going to be, just right to the north of that, they're wanting to put apartment complexes. Now we have to first get approval from the state to allow that into the Rural Housing and Incentive District. And then they approach the city after that approval, hopefully, and then we hash out the agreement between Mr. Warner and the city yes. of And we have a public hearing, and then the, the Board of County Commissioners and the school district get a letter outlining what that development agreement is, and then they have a veto period. A whole lot to throw, but it's really good, I mean, because we're able to use other funding from other municipalities to help with our infrastructure and, and get things that we wouldn't necessarily have. So, do you guys have any questions? Concerned? Okay, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. I mean, I was going to add that the next step, I think it was step five, involves you know, the, the actual detail of a particular development and you do have to give notice to the Board of County Commissioners and the school district, and then they have an opportunity to find that it would be adverse to them. And if so, uh, your, your plan couldn't proceed. So there, as the mayor was just saying, there's a lot going on here, and there will have to be a lot of communication with those other taxing districts <laughs> as individual projects develop. So this is pretty much just saying, do we want to do first send off the district for Mr. Warner? And also, do we want to start off with the yellow? Yeah, so basically this first resolution would be going to the state saying, you guys want to consider these tracts of land in what's called a reinvestment housing incentive district. If the state's like, that looks good to me, they'll send it back and say, yes, we're okay with that. And then the city needs to sit down with Mr. Rick Warner and hash out what's called a pro forma, which means for sake of the form. And it's basically a cost analysis and breakdown of expenses and what you're proposing and what you're hoping to get in terms of taxes from the city, taxes from the school district, taxes from the county. And as mentioned, it could be a 50% breakdown <coughs> or something along this line uh, where you're committing a certain amount of dollars and then we would have to see is it reasonable we'd also have to see is it eligible based on what you're proposing because it can only go towards housing which would be you know apartments and whatnot and then if it's agreeable we would bring that development agreement to the city either probably during either before as like a preview or during the public hearing 
to say this is what we've hashed out with Mr. Rick Warner what do you guys think and during that public hearing people can comment and the school district and board county commissioners can give a can give their comment and feedback any questions is that map on our agenda I'm not seeing it. no okay. which one uh, that, that map no this one's not your agenda has got four attachments. Most of them are resolutions. Okay. I don't see the negative in us saying, let's propose this to the state. I think there's a lot of steps and catch-alls if there is something that concerns people. There's a lot of checks and balances, and ultimately, as mentioned, the school district and the Board of County Commissioners have a veto authority, so if you guys were even hypothetically 100% behind one project versus another, if the school district vetoes it, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah, every taxing authority has to give its thumbs up right. in order for it to go through. So there's a hypothetical nothing can be approved. <laughs> so this is just the first step if we want to. Started. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it hurts to at least start the process. See if we can get the school district and the county commission on board. And ultimately, everybody benefits after whatever that percent, you know, that when the city hashes out, okay, I'm just throwing a hypothetical out there. The city hashes out, 20% goes to water and sewer, right, and then 10% goes for whatever, I don't know. And then once that's paid off, then you have 100%, and then it goes back to all the taxing authorities, correct? Okay. So. so, do I have a motion or anything? I'll make a motion. Motion by Aubrey. Second. Second by Keaton. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. We will add these legal descriptions to the resolution. There was a map, and then I'll be working with Bond Council to send it off to the state, and you will get feedback. Perfect. How long do we think, Kevin? How long does it's it take? 1,000 years. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's pretty direct. I mean, probably within a couple of weeks of sending. Oh, really? I would okay. expect probably a month at the Okay. So we could potentially bring it back to you in the second meeting in October. Okay. So if they were to hypothetically approve it before we even possibly want to amend it, you know, and add more ground into it, could we go back and say, okay, this is, I, I guess, our second one? Yeah, it'd be a resolution with an uh, amendment, but it would take... Yeah, maybe. Okay. And I don't, I don't know that it has to be an amendment. It could be another resolution. Just a whole nother... Approve that one that you have, and we're going to send you another one. And okay. You take whatever time you need with that one. Okay. Okay. This is item H.3. So this is a Tanganyika Wildlife Park Edition Plan Unit Development Final. So Bachman Company submitted a final plan unit development, a PUD layout for Tanganyika Wildlife Park. This is step four of four steps for final approval and adoption of a PUD. The PUD is considered a custom zoning classification. The first step was the public notice and hearing, which happened on December 9th of 2019 before the Planning Commission. Jim Fouts and his representative showed a concept idea for the Planning Commission consideration. Second step was the preliminary plat, which was approved by the Planning Commission on December 13th of 2021. The third step was the final plat, which was approved by the Planning Commission on December 13th of 2021. The final plat was then approved by the City Council on January 18th of 2022. This is step four for consideration and adoption by the City Council. The Planning Commission approved the final PUD on Monday, September 11th, and now the City Council decided if they want to approve the PUD as presented. It is approved. If it is approved, an ordinance will be published in the city newspaper, just like any other uh, zoning. City Council is considering approving a final plan unit development layout for the Tanganyika Wildlife Park addition. Total land area is around 4.7 million. Total acres about 108. Maximum lot coverage, there is no limitation. Maximum building height, 60. Access points from Hawkins, 1. Access points from 199th, 1. We did give them 60-foot right-of-way for access to 199th through our land, during our land swap agreement. 
Future animal exhibits, restaurants, animal barns, and outdoor entertainment are being proposed, generally speaking. This is the final plan unit development. It definitely looks better on your agenda packet. It gets somewhat pixelated when we export it. This is a concept rendering provided by Tanganyika to kind of outline some of the future proposed developments in that area. Financially, there is a small cost for publication since it would be an ordinance. Legally, it's approved as a form. It is recommended City Council waive the reading of the ordinance and then to approve the final plan unit development for the Tanganyika Wildlife Park addition for voice plus roll call. If you do have any questions, I do believe Matt Pouts is in the audience. If he does want to speak or talk about any of the future development that he has proposed. I got no questions. It all seems good to me. You got anything to say, Matt? It's all pretty direct forward. Yep. He wants to do more things. So Love it. That's what we want. We'll make a motion to waive the reading of the ordinance. Motion by Keaton. Second. Second by Aubrey. All in favor say aye. 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 Make a motion to approve the final planned unit development for the Tanganyika Wildlife Park Edition. Motion by Keaton. Second. Second by Sarah. All in favor say aye. 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 Mm. Roll call. Oh, roll yeah. call. Sorry. Councilman Fish? Yes. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Leland? Yes. Councilmember Larkin? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. The ordinance 935. Thank you very much. This is item H4. This is the Hawkins Lane Annexation Agreement. Uh, so the city desires to annex South Hawkins Lane in order to pave and maintain it. State law requires that the road is to be annexed. The abutting properties must be annexed as well. Discussion about annexation occurred on April 3rd of 2023 with the City Council deciding they were in favor of annexing the three properties with the owner's consent. The discussion between the property owners, Tanganyika Wildlife Park, and the City occurred on June 9th of 2023. From that meeting, the City drafted annexation agreements for the properties located on South Hopkins Lane. The petitions were circulated to the property owners and TWP for comments and feedback. City staff met with some of the property owners to answer questions and gather comments for the City Council. Comments for the property owners are listed in the analysis portion of the agenda item as well as questions for the purpose of clarity. The City Council is reviewing comments and questions regarding the annexation of properties along South Hawkins Lane. The seven um, questions right here are reflections of the property owners. So number one, they wanted to know if the mill levy currently applied to the property could be expressed in the contract agreement. 7.893. They also wanted to make sure the language expressed a run in perpetuity of the property, which it was mentioned 100 years. Section A lists the duration, uh, in perpetuity being forever. 715 South Hawkins Lane said there were multiple people on the deed besides Jill Barnes. There was Ryan Barnes, Carol Dooley, Revocable Trust, Norm Dooley, Revocable Trust, and they are asking if they need signature pages and notarized signatures as well, which that's an attorney question. Um, they want to know the manner in which they would be compensated for the difference expressed in the agreement. It's probably going to be a rebate, most likely, if this were to move forward. They want language stating that TWP will not put any more signs on Hawkins. They want that to be expressly um, um, listed in the agreement. And they want language stating that the approaches will be part of the pavement improvement. So I believe um, Harlan Fork and the city engineer included a cost estimate of what that would look like. They want language. Uh, they want a language stating that the city will regrade and maintain the ditches, and it was mentioned removing excess sand. I'm not really sure if that's in relation to, but I think they mentioned grading it and then removing sand. So those are some of the questions and, and comments that they had from the property owners. Uh, financially and illegally is approved as a form. It is recommended city council just review the annexation agreement, questions, comments, and direct staff accordingly. We do have Burke Brand, Burke Park Forest Director, we have Arnold Foraker, City Engineer, Matt Long, City Treasurer, Ryan Peck, City Attorney. So if you do have any questions or thoughts. Can you questions. go back to the questions? So the 7.893, the first one, whose mill levy is that? That's the county. So we do not set the county's oh, mill levy. We cannot control the, the county. That's the county. That's the Attica Township. Attica Township. Okay. Do we control Attica Township? So we don't control Attica Township. We can't do anything with that. They can change that at their will. So we can say that that the county or the township mill levy will be assessed as per it has been, but we can't specify a number, correct? Because we can't tell the township what they're going to. I think, I think the what our agreement 
what we suggested was that we would only uh, levy the amount of the current township levy yes. as our portion. Instead of levying our full portion, levying our full portion, which is 31.309 bills, we would only levy 7.893. And I think they are asking that that number 7.893 be the number that we levy going forward, regardless of whether the township raises or decreases theirs, which we would presumably have been using as the number going forward to determine what they get charged. So if we were going to, uh, so if this year the township mill levy is 7.893, that would be, we would basically be refunding them the difference between what we levy and that amount. Now next year, if the township raises it to 8.0 to one or whatever, uh, we would still refund them the difference between what we levied and 7.893 instead of the difference between what we levied and what the new township rate was. The township rate is going to go off completely for them. We were just going to use the township rate as the sort of benchmark for where to determine how much we would. Okay, so currently you pay township, but when right. you become a city resident, you don't pay township. Yeah, they'll, they'll be out of the township and in the city then. But their that makes so much more sense but now their, as to why. But their, prop, but their taxes will go up on school district, whatever else. The, there we are can't control that. Yeah, yeah. There are I mean, we can't control that. Yeah. 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 Okay. We're just saying the, the, city, the city, the city well, will not, assess that portion well, only of the city the, They're going to have to pay the full right. amount because we can't change what right. they actually get built because that's the county. Right. But we can refund them the difference. Okay, so, so what we're, we're saying right. is yeah. your city mill levy will be 7.893. Right. You'll get the difference back. Right, that's right. Oh, okay, that makes so much more and sense. But we can't, and as, as, as Matt Law mentioned, and that we can't, you know, we can't tell the county not to collect the full amount. Right. So you're, we're going to yeah. have to rebate and then them. We would, do we would have to rebate them every rebate. year, presumably. Yeah. The, and they want that expressed in the agreement that how right. are they going to get that difference? Mm -hmm. there. Sure. That's fine. Because, like, we get, like, I pay my taxes. Right. And then, however many, like, I pay my taxes in May. Yeah. How much later than do you guys get your payment from the county, city, state, whoever? Now we so we receive uh, the well we receive it five it's five or six times a year. We get the two big payments in January and then in July because you know the first bill goes out in mm -hmm. June, the second or not June. The first one goes out in November, I think, and then the second one goes out in July, whatever it is. We but we get our big chunk of them. So essentially what we would do is we would just have them submit verification that they paid their taxes and, and that can either be through you know direct payment or through a mortgage company or whatever just whatever that is just submit that and we'll kind of check for the difference okay okay and the 100 years in my meeting with them i believe it, it couldn't our attorneys were saying that we couldn't write a contract for 100 years it had to be 99 years is that correct there was some some legal jargon that says you can't bind Possibly. a contract for a hundred years. Possibly, like they're, they're essentially wanting it in perpetuity because I think I think you know some of the concepts that were discussed, the idea that as long as these folks remain the owners of the property, any concessions would apply. But in the event they sold, then all bets would be off as to. Uh, no, that what yeah. That, I mean, but they're wanting it in perpetuity. We had a we had a discussion. Me, Terry, and Mr. Fouts and the property owners had a discussion about one of their concerns was, well, if they do try to go sell it, then that would hurt their selling ability because it's at a new tax rate. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, this road is simply a road that the city of Goddard wants to pave. And we're, we're, I've talked to them, I've wanted to do it. Now, I don't know how we haven't gotten the sign agreements yet, because of the verbiage, apparently, it's not specific. Um, but I'm at the point to where what we discussed, we still have to discuss here. And I don't know if it's gonna get approved by these other council members. and. I'm at the point to where I don't I don't really know how to proceed forward. I, I need something from you guys to tell us 
what we discussed, is that what you guys will agree to? Okay, and, and this is what we said that we agreed to. Now, okay. After we had our meeting with you and then Micah, it took about a month to get the agreement back to us from the attorney. And I think it was about a month ago when we talked to him again about, about these issues specifically. And we haven't seen anything else. Okay. But okay. If, if the council were to agree to these terms, I'm saying if, because I can't speak for them, but if, you guys would give us a signed agreement if this verbiage, with that verbiage. If, with this verbiage, I would then feel that it was adequate enough that I would take it to my attorney for review and then, based on his recommendation, I would sign. What's the legal definition of imperpetuity? Imperpetuity in 100 years are two different terms, right? It's basically forever. 100 years is longer than any of us here. Well, not, I, not that I want to do this, because I do want to work with our neighbors. Um, we can just go in and annex this if we want to, right? If it's that important to us that we want to pave this road, that we want to pay 330000 or half of 330000 whichever number it is, to pave this road to help a business that brings in thousands, I don't know, how many visitors do you bring in every year, Matt, of people to Goddard to buy from our businesses. Um, I'm just... Yes. Okay. I believe we would have the right. We have the right to just stand exit and say, hey, you get to pay taxes now, you get to do... Okay. Well, and, and you can ask us for water and sewage and all those things. And with the, okay. the PUD that we just finished, Tanganyika is getting bigger and better by the year. So it's becoming a destination. I was there a couple of weeks ago and there was a family from South Carolina that came just to see Tanganyika. So it's becoming enough of a destination that it's bringing people to our community. I don't disagree. I think that's why the, the whole point was to try to get, get this road done, you know, and uh, it's taken time. Of course, I, I knew it was going to take time, but uh, at this point, I mean, we need to hash it out, get it quick, because we need to either say we're going to pave this road, or we, we need to take this money and do something else with it, Well, is what is what I'm getting down to. I, I think ultimately you guys have to decide, are these demands worth it from the policy standpoint? Are you comfortable with that? I'm fine with number one. Number three, like you said, is a lawyer question. Um, four, we discussed. Um, five, I think Matt agreed to. I don't know. The the number we got that includes the approaches, correct? Harlan, right, do you want to answer yeah, that question? I think I think we did put an estimate of, of paving the approaches to the right of way. We don't have the authority to go on private property to pave an approach, but it would be paving the approach from the edge of the new road to the right of line. And then number seven, do we have a quote on what the regrade and maintaining the ditches and removing excess, excess sand and all that? Is that? I mean, once, we, once we got it paved, I would think that that sand, I mean, if there's sand in there, we would we would probably try to clean it out with that project it to, make be, it, to make it great. And then the sand problem would probably go away because the road's paved. So it wouldn't be a huge extra I, I don't know if we're talking about we're six inches or six feet but i assume it's a small amount okay i don't think we have any problem going in and removing the sand and of course because it's our road will make tape okay so i, I get, think i think number two is the only one i am kind of hung up on i think when the property sells it should go to your in the city of goddard you should go to regular taxes or maybe include wording the taxes will stay at the 7.83, but if you request water and sewer, because it is in the verbiage that you can request water and sewer, the minute when you request water and sewer, you now get to pay the full city assessed tax because you're asking for something from us. And that's what our normal citizens have to do is they have to pay the assessed tax to have city and water and all those things. So I, I guess that's kind of where I'm coming in. One question with that is, uh, still doesn't the property owner pay the water and sewer. Feel free to come on up, guys, if you like. Yeah, I'm, so I'm yeah, fine. It's hard to you hear you guys back it's there. It's easier to hear you guys. Um, can you come up? Yeah, I can hear you guys. So, yeah, that's how it works. Like, well, see, traditionally, that's how it should work. Like, 2nd Street, us, us repaving 2nd Street. 
historically, when a, a road's paved, the homeowners pay for that road to be paved. Like anybody in St. Andrews, they paid specials for all their roads and stuff to be paved. We paid assessments for water and sewer and all that stuff. Um, at that time, in my mind, no, I'm not asking the five, three, four residents on that street if they want water and sewer to pay the full amount of what it costs to bring everything in. In my mind, that's not fair, but I would ask that at that time, if if I if that resident saying I want water and sewer, okay, you're going to the same tax rate that mill levy that everybody else in the city is paying. No, we we, we did discuss that if they wanted, I okay. yeah Sorry, I no, you're, you're talking about yeah. the property tax, but we did discuss if they chose to bring water and sewer over to over to them, they would pay for that. The homeowners would. Yeah, the property. Yeah, I don't think that's what we were told. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. We yeah. would have said well. Now you're talking about talking if they about choose to do that, then their property taxes, their go, property to the taxes go to the city rate because we're servicing the water and sewer. So we to have water and sewer plus pay a 30% It's not a 30% melody. It's not a 30% melody. It's a 30% melody. Line number two was blocked. Blocked was brought to us initially. We did not ask for that, mm -hmm. correct? Okay. And I believe in April, yes. you, you had actually brought it up that it would be a, a hundred year deal. I do not recall saying a hundred years. I, it was I, remember, I remember saying clearly here and over at Tanganyika that we would do it because I remember the attorney said something about we couldn't do it for 100 years, it was 99 years. Okay. You know, same thing, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I know we're not, but you know, legal jargon or whatever. But, but, but I, I guess I'm, I have to know what to direct staff for. Council, they need to tell us what they want. Sarah's talking about, you know, raising the, you know, if you guys choose to bring the utilities there, you guys are at the new mill levy, current with everybody else. Keaton, Aubrey, we uh, we but just that, need direction. See, I didn't realize that the homeowners were saying if they asked for water, it'll be assessed. That, it will be assessed. I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, I think for me, number two is is the biggest hang up. Um, just because I don't, I don't know. For me, it's like seventy years from now. Let's let's just say you guys were to move in 10, 15 years, which I doubt will happen. You guys have a great gig up where, where you're at. The spots are awesome, but let's say you guys move here in fifteen years. And then that family lives there for five years. And then the next family moves in, you know. Then it's like, okay, well, now we're, we're helping out somebody who moves, you know, five families from now. Why should they benefit from what you guys fought for? It's just kind of my I, – I don't want this to hold back Goddard in the future. But with what Sarah is saying about if they chose – if the new property owner chose or the current property owner chose to bring in uh, the city's utilities and that kind of stuff, then that changes. I think I'm more comfortable with that. That makes sense? Yeah, I mean, a lot of words real quick. What what we come up with ultimately has to be agreed by all three of those neighbors. And if we don't have an agreement by all three of those neighbors and a majority vote of this council, we don't have a deal. And if we don't have a deal, then what I need to know is, are we just going to kill this deal and move on and take our money and go take our three hundred fifty thousand dollars and put it somewhere else in Goddard? I would like to do this deal. I want to do this deal. But I don't want to waste any more time. No, That's I, all I, I care yeah, about. Yeah, I'm fine with paving the road. Like I said from the get-go, the only, my concerns are one, protecting the quality of life of the property that I'm highly invested in, and two, protecting the resale value of my home. Right. Um, because sure. it is a huge investment, obviously. For, for sure. Yeah. So um, I, I have no... Aubrey, whether sorry. Whether the road in or not, I don't care. It's those I hear you. I just, I mean, two is, is my only hang-up right now, too, but I think we need more language. Um, that dives in a little bit deeper. What language well, do we want? What do we want it to where it begins and ends with them? Is how long do you want the preferential property tax rate to last? I guess that's the biggest question for me because I'm, I'm with you when you resell the home. I mean, how does that hinder to the one that's beginning? I'm not like I mean, I know it's, I mean, that's a question in my head. Is like, you know, if you happen to sell in 10 years, what does that do to your potential 
fire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. I know for reason of life now, too, after this deal is done, which is probably yeah. yeah. something about our property, and all of a sudden they have all these expenses that, are, that, that you haven't normally dealt with that, mm -hmm. that they're you know, they don't make new land though, but you know, so um, there's probably a buyer there. But I mean, that's where my thought process is. So the language of in, in perpetuity in 100 years, I don't know what the what the value of that is. I think it needs to be looked at more of um, what's your strategy if you happen to have to sell it, and then I think that should die at that point. You know, I mean, either they assume those. Um, Cost or so do we want do we want to do the n number two it pretty much begins and ends at the ownership of the current property owner because the, the you dragging the utilities that is very basic yeah when, I mean, when you drag utilities the the property owner benefiting from those utilities gets assessed whatever it costs we bond it out we pretty much carry the loan but they are making the payment now, we're hung up on number two, the 100 years. Do we want to proceed with the 100 years or do we want to change it to where it begins and ends with their ownership of the property? Once they sell it, it goes to the new current rate that everybody else is in. Okay, so here, here's my thought, here's my question. Say your house is worth $500,000. What annually tax-wise are we going to be rebating them if their house is worth five hundred thousand dollars does that make sense Matt? yeah okay because basically like you go to sell your house the new owner you know you can say my current property taxes are this but because of this special agreement we have with the city you're actually considered a city of goddard resident here's what your tax base is what your tax rate what you're going to pay every year for taxes just because like when anybody buys a house, they look at the estimated tax or previous year's taxes or whatever. Um, like when I built my house and the first bill, I was like, ooh, these taxes are low. And then that second year when the house was there and all the things I'm like, what happened? And all of the specials and stuff, because I was stupid and young. Um, so I didn't understand how it worked. But that's something. Matt's crunching the numbers. Yes, he's crunching the numbers. Thank you, Matt. After I log in with my correct password. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just it. because this seems, you know, you guys are very, you know, like this is a hard, like, item for you. So I want to know, like, what dollar amount we're actually. I do also want to remind you, though, that this, that number two was actually offered to us at the beginning of all of this. By that me. Actually By not me. Not just something mm -hmm. we invented in our right. manual. No, yeah, no, no, sure. no, no, yeah. no, no, yeah. yeah. And yeah. now we're saying, okay, yes, that's what we well, want. It was, yeah. it was offered yeah. <laughs> by me. I approached it to you guys, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but I, I can't make a decision I, for the whole yeah, council. So. Right. So how, how much weight is it? No, we'll, we'll still blame Larkin regardless. That's what we do. <laughs> but Everybody likes to blame me. So what, how much weight does it have on the property owner? Yeah, where's your, where's your heart on number two right now? Between that and the levy, those are the two biggest uh, conditions of where I, I would ask for. Well, if if we locked it in for your guys' ownership, though, and once you sold. Well, and what if we even said your ownership, and if you were to, like, pass it on anybody in your family, it sticks this way. It's only if you sell to somebody yeah, outside your sticky. family. Yeah. Is that that's sticky. Is there a number of years yet? Up until 25 years, 50 years, but like it, as long as it was this amount. So if you don't sell within 25 years, it's on you. If you sell within 25 years, you get the benefit. Or see, and as long as they live there, I don't want <laughs> them to have to pay that rate. So if I'm the all three property owners, all three property owners have discussed this, and since it was offered to us, this is what we came up with. Um, okay. So we're gonna have to talk to Calvin probably Glenn and everybody else just to renegotiate this. Depending on what you guys are offering us, because we, we don't know. We were we were offering one thing at the very beginning of the house. Well we gotta figure out what we're offering here. So they know what the hell they need to go do. I mean just to remind you you guys did vote on this in that meeting back in like April and you guys all agreed to it. 
Well, we have voted on the bond issuance. Yeah. We have voted on the bond yeah. issuance. If you voted, if, if Micah could mediate with us and We we did not we because can only get yeah no I'm trying to pull I don't it up recall a great no. yeah what do we want to do with number two guys yeah I'm waiting for uh, Matt's number mm -hmm. I would recommend that it ends with uh, uh, current ownership yeah I I prefer it ends with current ownership I agree current ownership okay so if it's current ownership. Well, how soon will you guys have that draft done? Just the current ownership. Locked in at the 7.893. Well, I think we have a draft agreement, so we just have to change that 100 years to. What's the probability of us getting that signed it with that? Signed or declined? <laughs> with the current signed ownership? With the current I'm ownership. I'm going to go back to the resale value on the house, which is our initial concern. So I, I, I'm not understanding how. It affects the resale value of your house. So the person's gonna, the, your house is valued what it's valued at. They're just gonna have to pay more property taxes, and it's not. Do you have a I wait. About uh, just a little under thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah, it's thirteen hundred dollars. That's a hundred bucks a month extra that somebody's okay. paying. Well, so somebody buying a house that's valued as high as your guys, I would think that much wouldn't make or break a deal. But if we're gonna, if, if the next owner is going to pay that high, there's no money should there not be then some um, renegotiation on what the terms of the and um, utility services. But do you guys have like an appraisal or a evaluation from a realtor that indicates how much the value of your home would be affected? But it's not taxed at a higher rate. It's not taxed at a higher rate. It's taxed at, at the current rate that everybody else is taxed at. It's yeah, just but even but with the rest of our city. If they were to sell their property right now, it would be taxed at seven point seven point eight nine three. And that's what the buyer would be anticipating. But what you all are proposing is if they choose to sell, then the rebate goes away. And their comparables and so can pull from a different the taxes time. will be at 30 right. or whatever. They're comparable. Right. And okay. so what I'm asking is, do we have a report or an opinion from an appraiser or a realtor that actually quantifies any change in the value of the property as a result? Is that going to change the like council's mind? Yeah, is that going to change the council's mind? Or do we want to lock in at the property owner? With the current property owner? I want locked in. Locked in? Locked in? I'd like it locked in with the property owner. Yeah. Okay. What Are I'm. Locking it in at that rate? Locking it in at I'm whatever I'm the township mill might be. I'm fine locking it in at the yeah. same The only thing I want changed is the 100 years to current property owner. Yep. At the 7.93. Yep. Yes. 7.893. Okay. So, if it's okay with you, Aubrey, and the rest of the council, we direct staff to amend the agreement, change the agreement, send it to them this week, have it to them by the end of this week, and we need to set a time limit. If we don't have a signed agreement, we move on. The deal's done, and we take the money and we do something else because we can't waste any more time. When do we when do we want that? By the next meeting? Mm. Uh, Thirty days from now. I think Which 30 two days meetings. from now because they know what the wording will be. So Which is two meetings? Well I mean if it's thirty days, yeah. That's a month. I think it's fair. I mean that's I mean thirty days from now. This needs to happen. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah, 30 days from now would be October 18th, which is two days after two meetings from now. So yeah. we discuss it, the third meeting from now. We wouldn't be able to discuss it again so until November November 6th. 6th. Let's it on we'll address it on two meetings from now. Yeah, two Can we address it on the 16th of October? Can Because that's 28 days. Can we just say that? 
Just the, whatever it Instead of 30, can we just Monday. push it to 28 yes. that way? Yes. Okay. So by the 16th of October is when yes. we're going to cut. We need, a, we need to have a decision. So do we need to make a motion or do you guys just know what to do? <laughs> because, because the way it'll work oh, is if they're agreeable to it, they'll sign it, and then it comes back to you. For then we approve her. Yeah. Okay. And if they don't agree, just we're just moving on. Yeah. We're done. Yeah. Okay. I still like follow okay. up with if they yeah. agree or not. But yes, that's of course not we can. So once it's been like, amended, if they don't agree, then I at the annexation, agree so that it dies. Yes, yeah, so the petition for annexation will be changed. We will send them out, um, and they can review them. And then, if they're okay with it, even I, even if they don't necessarily sign them right away and get it back to us, at least if they are agree or have a verbal agreement, and then we get those annexations signed, then we can proceed. Okay. And we can let you know one way or another. If they don't agree to it, then we can just say that they don't agree. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. So this is item H.5. So this is city code prohibiting storing on public grounds. So the city has come across instances where individuals have personal equipment, automobiles, watercrafts, uh, refuse or other miscellaneous personal items located outside of their personal property inside city public land or parks. The city code prohibits damage to the public park land, but does not implicitly dictate the prohibition of this type of incident. And city staff would like to add additional language to the city code that strictly prohibits the storing of personal items on public land. This ordinance would assist city staff in citing Individuals who use public land, either knowingly or unknowingly, if adopted, the city would use, it would issue certified letters outlining adopted code, and if it's not abated, the city would go through the abatement process, similar to tall grass or junk motor vehicles. So the city council is considering approving an ordinance that adds language to the city code of, um, of chapter 12 that prohibits the storage of personal items on public land. Now the city currently has code listed under chapter 12-103 uh, damaging park property and we would like to add uh, the blue text below keep the purple text and basically it would outline that it shall be unlawful for any person except duly authorized city employees to willfully or wantonly remove uh, injure tarnish deface destroy any building walk bench tree or improvement or property of any kind belonging to any park owned or managed by the city no one shall place, store, deposit, um, or refuse <coughs> to remove when requested any personal property, trash, refuse metal, plastics, oil drums, stacked wood, brush piles, watercraft, motor vehicles, RVs, construction material, or any on any park property. And this provision shall not apply to items in the immediate possession of a person, which items are consistent with the use and enjoyment of the public park. So basically what we're saying is you can't store personal property and material in a public park if you bring certain personal property or material that's used for the enjoyment of the park that's separate. So that's basically what's outlined here. There would be a small cost for publication legally. It's approved as the form. It's recommended City Council waive the reading of the ordinance and approve the ordinance amending the City of Goddard Code, Chapter 12, Article 1, City Parks. The ordinance was reviewed and approved by Robert Koykendall, which is why ex um, colleague at Morris Lane. This just seems like common sense. Yeah. <coughs> Make a motion to waive the reading of the ordinance. Second. Motion by Keaton, second by Sarah. All in favor say aye. 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 I make a motion to approve the ordinance amending the city of Goddard Code, Chapter 12, Article 1, City Parks. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Most Keaton. Long. Roll call. Councilmember Fish. Yes. Councilmember Neely. Yes. Mayor Dykin. Yes. Councilmember Collins. Yes. The ordinance 936. Thank you very much. This is item H.6, North Park Land Update. So city staff presented material that can be considered for removal on the North Park on June 5th, 2023. It was discussed that if the material could not be auctioned, the city would bring it back to the city council request funding to hire contractors to remove the listed items. It was submitted to Gavel Roads to be hosted on their website to be auctioned off. Gavel Roads informed the city that they did not feel that it would be worth their time to host these items. City staff is bringing this item back to City Council request permission to solicit bids for removal of the items on the North Park land. If the bids come in under the discretionary spending authority, City staff will proceed with the removal of the items. If bids come in over the approved spending authority, City staff will have to come back to City Council for permission to enter into a contract agreement at the specified amount. The City is also working with an engineering firm to come out on October 9th to review the larger barn for structural integrity. And that's something that Harlan Foy can speak more about if you want to, Harlan, at this point. Well, yeah, uh, engineering consultants uh, is going to send an engineer out to take a look at the structure of that building to see if it it may have been designed, you know, for like loading parameters that really aren't fit for human habitation. Okay, so if that's the case, if it's just an animal 
type building and you know without significant upgrades you probably wouldn't be able to use it for some sort of a human use. We thought we might be able to use it as a pavilion of some kind or something. So we just want to make sure it's cool. It's, we want to bear, we want to verify that it's not going to work for that. So we're going to bring somebody up to take a look at it. Okay. Cool. These items um, were included in the, in the previous meeting when we discussed what we'd be removing. So um, a certain length of fencing. There's also the question that, that came up of the windmill with the pump. I believe, I believe Councilmember Trailer mentioned the possibility of auctioning it off. I don't know if that's an option or not, but that's something that if you want to consider, you can look into it. But as mentioned, Gavel Rose did not want to think any of this stuff would be relevant. So um, that's why we would talk about just simply hiring somebody to haul it all off and then demolish that small um, <coughs> stable over here. I believe the larger one, just demolish the smaller one. Financially and unlegally approved as form, it is recommended to approve the solicitation, solicitation excuse me, of bids to remove selected items in the North Park land. By motion. motion. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Keaton. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Fine. <laughs> hey, didn't Brent offer to pay for that window? I think he said he'd give us 100K. I think it'll be said. Was it only 100? So he's getting a steal. Well, the. He's got a haul. The haul off fee is about another 100K. Oh, sure. So he was out. I think All right, budget night part two. It's here. Uh, so uh, the current legislation uh, requires we will a revenue neutral rate public hearing if we adopt a new levy that's above the revenue neutral rate as defined by the state. And what that means is the actual dollar amount of property tax that we collected this year, if we want to collect more than that next year, we have to essentially back out that amount from our mill levy and adopt that same dollar amount. If we want to adopt what I'm proposing, we have to have a second public hearing. So that's what this is. Uh, the mayor will open the public hearing, open the revenue neutral rate public hearing to receive public comment. Um, and then each speaker will have three minutes. Okay, we'll open up the public hearing. Is there anybody that would like to speak? <laughs> Going once. Going twice. Sold. Okay. We'll close the public hearing. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, not the resolution to exceed the revenue neutral rate for the 2024 annual budget. The revenue neutral rate as presented is 31.309 mills. I make a motion to adopt the resolution to exceed the revenue neutral rate for the 2024 annual budget. Motion by Sarah. Roll call. Second. Second by Keaton. Roll call. Councilmember Fish? Yes. Councilmember Lehman? Yes. Mayor Larkin? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. He's got it in his folder. Is, is your, I have a sheet in there that I need to make sure it's really sad, Matt. You should work on that. You're really good at your job. <laughs> <laughs> it did take you a little bit too long to give me that. What's your what's your home office password? Try it. Thank you. 
flash and key? No, I figured it out. Oh, the, second, the second slide. Oh, okay. put up. Yeah. Make a motion to adopt the 2024 operating budget as presented. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Aubrey. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. <coughs> oh, man. That's Matt, that was painless. Thank you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate you. Now, yeah. <coughs> I'm HA is the water waste wastewater treatment facility UV system rehabilitation. Um, fluid disinfection is the final step of the wastewater treatment process. Disinfection reduces and destroys the bacteria, virus, and protozoa populations. In the M's one project is charging into the receiving body of water. It is critical to the protection of public health and the environment. UV light provides rapid effective inactivation of microorganisms through a physical process. When bacteria, viruses, and protozoa are exposed to germs on wavelengths of UV light, they're instantly rendered incapable of reproducing and infecting. The UV system at the city's wastewater plant began malfunctioning in early 2023. If you'll remember on March 6, 23, council meeting, uh, Pebble Burks received approval to hire Xylem Water Systems Solutions USA to conduct an on-site service call to diagnose and possibly repair the system. Um, their technicians spent three days testing, patching, and repairing the system as much as they could. They identified severe corrosion, extensive damage in the system, control box from water damage due to the flooding of the facility basement. Um, the poor condition of the control panel limited repairs to a temporary fix that reduced functionality but allows the UV system to operate and staff to manually adjust treatment processes when required. Um, this kind of illustrates, first off, it's kind of a poor design. You've got a basement with a lot of pipes, you've got all kinds of valves that can break. This flood happened, we came back in the morning and a reuse valve broke, filled it up with water to this level. This, this should have been designed elevated in the first place, terrible design. So that kind of shows you where the water level was. That's the control cabinet itself, uh, further illustration of the water level. This is the inside of the control cabinet. As you'll see, water and electronics doesn't mix well, so we ended up with some with, with a mess. Um, another issue we found, or the tech found from Asylum when they got in there is, uh, we don't know if it was prior unqualified electricians or if it were city employees that thought they knew what they were doing, but there were a significant number of jumper wires putting th connecting things that shouldn't be connected. Mm. Um, when amateurs do work, they don't know what they're doing, that's what you get. Um, this photo here kind of shows the whole system. This is the control cabinet. These are the vessels one and two where the, where the water goes through, where the UV lights are actually situated to disinfect. Um, the cost of the UV, okay, so the cost of what, the cost of the system, I feel like I'm missing a slide here, but apparently not. Okay, so what they recommend is basically rehabbing that entire system, putting in a new control panel, new boards, um, they're going to elevate it, take it off the ground, so if we have another plug in it, it does not destroy it. Um, the cost of that system, those system improvements is $262,251. Um, it will be allocated 100% to the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, Capital Outlay. If you remember, this is um, federal money received after COVID. Um, right now, the fund balance is $770,000. This money must be expended no later than December 31st, 2024. And I believe, and Matt can clarify, it doesn't have money have to go largely to utility systems and items like that. There are a lot of different uses, but we identified uh, public utilities early on as allowable uses that we knew we needed uh, infrastructure investment for. Uh, there were, I, I know the county at one point, I don't know if they ended up doing it or not, they were talking about paying, using it to pay uh, hazard pay, uh, there's, a, there's a myriad of uses, but everybody in public finance that I've spoken to over the last couple of years since we first got this has agreed that the infrastructure uh, additions specifically for water and sewer would, are probably, for most local governments, are going to be, small governments like us, are probably going to be the best use of those funds, have the fewest reporting requirements, et cetera. So. Yeah. This is, unfortunately, this is a, a big expenditure. It's forcing me to have the ARPA money, so it doesn't come out of our own budget. But it's one of those things, if we don't repair this and the UV system goes down, typically the KDHE levies a $10,000 a day fine. So it would take a month before we already spent this much money. So it's one of those things. Um, 
Legal, this has approved, been approved as a form. Any questions? Is Why there, haven't we spent this money earlier? We did not know until now. This oh. was the item in March 6th that you all approved that we did. We thought we were hoping we were going to be able to fix it then cheaper. But unfortunately, when he got there, and, and they sent out a check this time that's really good. He spent three days just pouring through it. I have a lot of confidence in it and what he found. We, he, he's patched it. We are running it now. We're switching from vessel to vessel manually, which is not the best way to do it, but we were able to run it. Um, so but this, this will get it back to to new conditions as far as running it. What, what cost is the flood anyway? Um, we had a reduced valve break, and that's one of those things you can get up when you think everything's fine, and it's been operating fine. It didn't give us any indication, and boom, and then I broke, and it locked up, and it caused all flood water, and we came into the morning we had water in the, in the basement. It's not been the first time in the history that plant has happened. I mean, if one of these days, hopefully, council can take a tour of all these facilities, and you'll see just how complex they are. This is this is a multi-million dollar plant with miles and miles of piping and air, water, everything flowing through there. It's it's quite a complex machine, and at times things happen. So you said elevating will prevent that from happening. It will. It will. You know, you, you've got you know 18 inches of water in there. We get it up near two, three feet. But we've never had any more than 18 inches in there. We don't have that. That once in the four years I've been here, and Mike said they've had it once prior. So it's, it's an infrequent event. It's, it's something that sometimes happens. Well, do we want to spend our Sleepy Joe money? Yes, please. Yeah. I recommend I make a motion to approve hiring, however you say that, to rehabilitate the wastewater UV system for the cost of $262,200. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Keaton. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Can we get one of those Sleepy Joe meals <laughs> painted on the bottom? <laughs> 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 get, get a Sleepy Joe meal painted on the bottom. Sleepy Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of the stickers that says I did this. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I actually, I'm not putting it on the plan. I'm not getting all of that. <laughs> I just want it to work properly and then we'll be good. <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right. So, so anyway, <laughs> is, is the water tower booster station third kind of edition? Um, water has been a big topic of conversation, and not only additional water rights, but getting water from the ground to the tank to the tower to the consumer is one of those situations. And this third pump um, will allow that to happen quicker. Um, the water tower complex includes two water storage tanks, a half million gallon elevated water tower, and a five and another half million gallon ground tank. Um, a city water well is pumped directly into the ground storage tank. The water is then pumped into the elevated tower via a booster station that contains these pumps. There are currently two in there. And once the water enters the distribution system to the once the water once in the tower, the water enters the distribution system to the final. Here's a picture of the complex, kind of give you an idea. There's the 500,000 elevated or ground tank. Water goes some walls directly to that. This is the booster station. There are two pumps in there now, and there's a pedestal for a third. And there are pumps into that. It flows out of the system under pressure. And the our tank doesn't have a all along. It was the way the picture came out because I had to do a panoramic to that. It's like Max's tank. <laughs> so the tank is actually the tower's still around. <laughs> Um, we're not expecting baby towers anytime soon. <laughs> okay, at peak production, the city's full of water wells a pump approximately 2,100 gallons of water per minute into the ground tank. The two booster pumps that are there now can transfer about 1,800 gallons a minute. That is a deficit if we get into a, a real peak use condition where the tower's going down and we're trying to keep it full. Um, if one of those pumps fails, we are down to about 900 gallons a minute. We, are, we will be in, in, in trouble at peak, peak demand times particularly in the mornings and the summertime when irrigation and showers and everyone's doing their stuff. The, it was built with two operational pumps, the booster station was, and a single location is piped to allow the addition of a third booster pump. The third pump, as I said, gives redundancy and additional pumping capacity for future system upgrades. But the additional pump also allows for more rapid transfer from the ground tank to the tower in high demand. This is a picture in Todd's side of the booster station. These are the motors, the pumps, and the piping, big check valve and stuff. These are the two existing pumps. Each one of them are run approximately 900 gallons per minute. As I said, when this was built, there's a pedestal and everything to put the third pump in. So it's relatively inexpensive to do that. If it was, that wouldn't work there, it'd be quite a bit more expensive. 
Um, the cost to purchase and install that third pump is for $45,750. That would also be allocated 100% to ARPA, capital outlay. And as I said before, there's 770,000 in that that must be expended before December 31st of 2024. Questions? Any idea how long it'll take to get the third pump and install it? I do not have an exact time. I spoke with the vendor and I told him quick. He said as soon as we have a PO2 in, he can give me the availability there one of those things. Okay. First come, first serve on those sure. terms. Is this going to handle the density <coughs> predictions in the future? Say again, I'm sorry. Is it going to handle the density predictions in the future? Well, or is, or is um, as we grow, we're going to need well. to add bigger pumps. We're, well, the pumps, the pumps are limited. I mean, Yes, we could have, have bigger pumps, I think. I'd have to ask, and that'd be an engineering question depending on piping and what we can get through there, maybe. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about water here. We've talked about additional storage, and which could be possible in future additional storage in another part of town with another actual tower. And so it just depends on where we go, where we grow, whether we get new water rights. But in the future, if we go to 10,000 um, or more, we'll need additional storage for sure. Now, there, originally there was some discussion that we could add 500,000 more by building this tank up. I spoke with, with the company that built it, and unfortunately the, the foundation of that will not hold the extra weight, so that is a no-go. Uh, that's, unfortunately, that's just the way that works. Um, but we will need additional storage in the future. This, this, with other things we're doing that the county we're going to be bringing to council, will, will help us get water when we need it. We'll, we'll burn through that 770. Oh, yes. We'll, 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 yeah, we'll burn through that because we'll we, don't, we don't want to give it back. Yeah, well, they, my, my they they it. <laughs> we all paid for it. Why would we give it back? Why would we give it back? Can just spend well, the next time? If, we, if we upgrade it now to look for the future, I mean, is it, is it cost effective to do that? I mean, if we're going to we're going to have density increase over time. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, I don't think anything at this particular site is going to solve that problem. Uh, I think this is a solution for the next five years, combined with our uh, connection to another water source, which we're currently in discussions about the rural water district. That will get us through this next five year period until we can locate uh, additional water rights or another uh, connection to another supplier that will meet that, you know, 10 year, 15 year. I, and I agree with Matt. I think one big thing that we need to think about in, within that period is additional storage. I think that's a huge thing that, I mean, we can only pump it so fast. If we can store it, it's easier to get it out to the consumer to try to get it, to get it pumped out the ground. And my, and my thought on storage was, if we're going to be getting storage, which is probably going to be coming from the north side of Kellogg, it makes sense to put that storage on the north side of Kellogg because they're really under or bring a new source uh, supply line under Kellogg back to where we currently are. Right? But your leftover ARPA funds couldn't pay for a whole new. No, the, no. The, and, and we won't we wouldn't be able to do it in uh, less than a year and a half either. Yeah. Um, so the, the remaining ARPA funds, what, we, what it will be probably used for is the SCADA system, which is going to help control everything that we do public works wise. And that will definitely be an asset when we do add yeah. a second source and a second uh, storage uh, apparatus. Yeah, that'll be an asset across the board, the new SCADA system, if, if that pans out like we hope it does. Yeah, I think the other thing I'd add is, I think uh, uh, Brooke pointed to it, the wells right now only have a maximum capacity of 2,100 gallons per minute coming to our storage. And, and by having the third pump in there, we're going to have a 2,700 gallon per minute capacity at the pump stage. So we're in excess of that, of the wells right now. And so until we do find another source, and tie that together. I think you know this is about as best we can do. We're we're just about maxed out what the wells and what the pump and the storage can handle. The, the way we run our, our telemetry system over here is is when the tower gets to about eighty percent, it starts coming already from the tank to the tower. The tower, if the tank gets eighty percent, the wells come on. So we have really high ratios there that we try not to get it by get low. We we are not letting it get low anymore than we actually have to. Because if you have a fire or a break and you've got a tower down to 40% here you end up with the boiler. And we are going to do anything to avoid that. Okay, do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the installation of a third booster pump in the water tower complex for the cost of $45,750. Motion by Keaton. Second. 
second by Sarah. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, government body comments. Keaton? Um, only thing I had, uh, Micah, you and I had talked a little bit, and I think I'm going to mention it to Brooke, about what we need to do to get some sort of signage on Kellogg for Main Street. Do you remember that conversation? Mm, yes. Is there any update on that at all? No. I didn't. That's I think, all right. Uh, I will have a item in the capital budget in... Um, I'm going to try as hard as I can to get it to the first meeting in October. It might be the second meeting in October. Okay. But it is going to include a project that will include signage on Kellogg, some sort of gateway to the city type thing to go in at Maine and Kellogg. With a big flag. Huh? <laughs> I was thinking a statue of each one of you. There you go. Oh, we can but turn those into water storage towers. Let's make, make Mount, huge. Rush, Mount Mount Goddard with just yeah. our faces. But anyway, we, 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 we really want to do something to A, add parking on Main Street, uh, beautify Main Street, and have some sort of gateway in front door yep. to the city. Yep. So we'll have that included, and we'll, I mean, we'll, we won't have to do everything all at once. We'll wait on it all to go through. But we're hoping to get that done next year at the latest. So That's awesome. So okay, cool. Like right right. The, the old signs that came down were damaged. On Kellogg, things get damaged all the time. Yep. It would show up and they're broken off. They had a large sign that said Goddard, and then had all these little signs tacked on it. What kind of tagging, to be honest? So when they first went down, we took them down. They were like within two weeks of that, they both got dead. We took them down, and when the prime minister was here, we discussed putting new ones up, but he wanted a sign standard for the city, something that the council saw a design picked, and all the signs would match. Okay. It just never came to fruition. I didn't want to put this happy signs back up if we were going to get nice signs. Yeah, for sure. And so we can do the good signs. We'll put them immediately. We can just need to come up with what the signs are going to be like. And like Matt said, they're talking about a whole comprehensive, you know, theme. Yeah, yeah. And we yeah. want to we want to do like some sort of I don't know if monuments even the right word, but Angie had ideas about this too. So kind yeah, of we've talked about it a couple times. Okay, with that thing that we could maybe put the base or the put it in now, but then like. When we do our rebranding with our flag and stuff like that, we can do some kind Build of other top of it. With that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to. And does that require paid out? Does that require paid out approval, bro? Yes. It will. The signs will have to be a certain height off the ground. They'll have to have certain posts in them. Um, breakaway type. That breakaway type year. posts and, yeah. and certain height. They, it will have to be approved. I mean, I don't think they'll be totally strict with it. The signs they had out there were huge, and they had all this little stuff stuck to it. So yeah, we want to a little bit better. Be better than yeah. that. Something that's okay. got its own character and style. Yeah, something cool. Exactly. Something that yeah. gives us a bit of a brand. So, um, cool. I think. When did we meet last? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. That was before. Awesome. Main Street Market has wrapped up for the season. Uh, Angie and I went over numbers today. Uh, it was absolutely phenomenal. So, thank you to everybody who came out. Um, thank you, Angie. People will never understand the amount of work that that woman puts in for this city and uh, our events and fall fest is going to be incredible because of her so thank you so much for what you do for our city that's it sarah um spend that money <laughs> we're like 460,000 yeah. spent yeah it. it's we <laughs> that's the, the the confusion was in the beginning that they were going to make a run through the gamut federal regulations yes spend. i remember and they've since relaxed those so we're better able to do it now we want to do a skater system all along it's just been you know, the, the big ticket item that we want to make sure we get right. So it's we're going to try to do these this year, knock out that for hopefully uh, at least have it ready to go before the end of Q2 next next year. That way we're not going to hit any single audit threshold because we'll be able to spend some of it through some of it next year. And it should be fairly straightforward in getting it spent. What's, what's, okay. the, what's the rules to spend a Sleepy Joe Doe? Well, see, that was the thing. We didn't, we didn't, want, we didn't want no strings attached. We didn't want him telling us what to do, you know. So, uh, I don't do like talk, being told what to do. Sleepy Joe Doe. I like it. Yeah. Do we know, was a traffic study done at 183rd and 23rd Street? You had talked to the county. The county. Then we yeah. discussed that school wasn't in session. We were hoping they would wait until school was in session. Yeah, no, they, they did do a study. While they did another study session. while school wasn't in session. Okay, so we need to contact them again and say, hey, how yeah, do you? I can call Commissioner That'd be great, because yeah. it, be, it needs to be done when the majority, I mean, traffic is completely different there in the summer than it is during school. Yeah. And yeah. 
that's just and it needs yeah that's yeah thank you didn't we, didn't we talk about that when we were talking about the flock systems or something like that? Yeah, it's in the county. 183rd and 23rd is in the county. So that's why, uh, because it, okay. it came up before where people are, because it's an intersection that's perceived to be dangerous and stuff, so, uh, there was thoughts about what well, the city could intervene in, in that area. And it's just difficult because it's outside of our jurisdiction. Yeah. I'll just gonna stand out there. So we're just going to harass the county until they keep doing studies and studies and then yeah. do something. Okay. And hopefully okay. before somebody Aubrey. dies. Nice. Yep. Uh, yeah, you'll see everything I want to say. I'm good. All right. Um, frontage Road. Got the, survey, got, got the survey today. So okay. now we'll start dr drilling down into it on, you know, setting grades and widths and calculating quantities. What roughly time do you think we'll send that out to bid? Oh, goodness. That's, that's um, I, I would say 60 days maybe. It's going to take a little bit to get a set of plans put together. Okay. And we were going to maybe go to, uh, maybe just go directly to a contractor and see if they wouldn't price it. You know. Okay. Now, what about Second Street as well? Well, I'd like to do them, obviously, bid them together. Or right. Like bid them so yeah. that we could get the economies of scale and get better prices. So okay. I think we would be working on that in the same time frame. Okay. Second Street. S I, we got days. that survey. I got that both of the surveys just today. Okay. Um, now, in regards to Harlan's comment about just sending it out, are we able to do that to a contract to get a bid? Or do uh, we have to? Well, that? that's what I don't know if you're purchasing whatever the city's. I don't know what the city's we'd purchasing. Table. We'd have to take a look at it. Okay. All right. Well, we, we you guys just, hash that out. I want to yeah. just do it. I want to get her done. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. All right. And then uh, water agreement. I know that you're accused from that with. Uh, well, your oh. son has, with Evergy, or I don't know how much I'm supposed to say right now, but with with Evergy and Colwich, um, have we made any progress on that water reserve up in Colwich? So I spoke with Tom Adrian yesterday. So okay. Um, we scheduled a meeting to meet with them this Thursday. This Thursday? Mm -hmm. Okay. He's okay. going to represent us in water right negotiations. Okay. Okay. Is it coming along? Nicely, or do we know? The letter's been drafted. I've sent him the letter. He's reviewed the letter, so he wants to meet with us on Thursday collectively. Public Works um, Director Harlan, Matt, Terry, myself. Ryan can't be there, obviously, he has to keep himself, but right. that would basically help us draft our negotiation tactics to move forward with speaking with Evergy to acquire more water. Awesome. Very good. Okay, and then the square cents per square foot fee structure. Uh, yeah, I looked at Maze. So Maze is slightly different than Wichita. So Wichita has a square foot fee. Uh, that was that ordinance that I sent to Robert, kind of emulated that fee. Robert didn't like, Robert Corkin all didn't like our square foot fee. He said it was too arbitrary. Um, and so I looked at Maze's calculation. It was actually based on the last three averages from the last three developments that they did. They averaged it together to come up with a calculation. I think Robert might be more inclined that way. I don't know if that's how we want to do it or not. Well, that would make sense. And then if we here in two years wanted to do a new calculation, could we not. could we do that? I would assume. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah, it would be up there the way we would be up there. Now, if we did the last three developments, would it come out roughly close to what Wichita is at? No. We don't want to be more, huh? I'm not sure if it would or not. Okay. Honestly, I would have to look at it, but I think the water and sewer dropped, right? you know, broke in Harlan. I don't know if you guys, I mean, originally we were bidding high in 2022 and then they came down. Bids are, bids are becoming more attractive now. So it might actually be lower than Wichita's current static rate. Okay. Well, we don't want to be too much lower, but no. I mean, we don't want to be over either. Yeah, you know how those attorneys are. We want to be right there in the sweet issues. spot. I don't know. There are attorneys out there. I was complaining about things. So. Okay. All right. Well, just as long as I'd like to bring that to council as soon as possible. So as we can. the attorneys are okay with it. Okay. Yeah. Whenever the attorneys are good with it, because if we can <laughs> get that in place and start collecting those fees, we can have a start getting a war chest built up. So that would be really nice. Okay. I don't have any other comments. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. motion to adjourn. Motion by Sarah, second by Keaton. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye.